heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And from verse 20, you perform signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day in Israel and among all mankind and have gained the renown that is still yours. The word of God for the people of God. Do you believe in miracles? Some years ago, I was preaching a series of sermons I had just started preaching at a couple of weeks earlier. I think I was on number two or number three at the time. And uh, when I got all done with the message that day, a couple of women from my congregation in their mid to late 30s came up and said, do you really believe that stuff? And I said, um, believe what, in miracles? Yes. Do you really believe in miracles? And I said, yes, I do. Absolutely. I've, I've been with multiple parishioners through the years. I've, I've seen miracles happen all around me almost daily if we're looking for them. Well, they said maybe in Jesus' day, but there's no such thing as miracles in the world today. And even though I tried to continue the conversation to find out just what was causing them to think that way, they turned and walked away, and I found myself deeply saddened. You know, through the years, as I say, I've, I've seen some miracles. What, what, what about the, what about the four-month-old baby that after 20 hours of being buried in the rubble in Puerto Rico was pulled out alive? What about the 28-year-old 20, uh, man in Nepal who after 80 hours with no food and no water was pulled out of the rubble in Nepal after an earthquake. He had a broken leg. They said 72 hours is just about the maximum the human body can go without water. And yet he made it easy. Or what about Carolyn? Carolyn was a member of one of my churches. I had a telephone call on July 4th weekend. It was the Fort Wayne City Police Department. Do you know Carolyn? Yes, I know Carolyn. We need to get all of her family. Can you give me a name of a contact person? I said, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't. I know she's got a daughter who lives somewhere here in Fort Wayne, but I'm afraid I don't know the daughter's last name. He said, we need to get a hold of the family immediately. And he wouldn't tell me anything else. I got on the phone, I started playing, making some calls to previous to other members of the church. And before they could call me back with what they knew, I had a second call, this one from the Indiana State Police Department. You know Carolyn? Yes. The same conversation. Can you tell me what's going on with Carolyn? I'm trying to find her family. Can you give me any information? No. We need to get all the Carolyn. There's the other family. By the time I got my calls back from a few people with the with the daughter's name and phone number. I had sensitive time. I had also been contacted by the Allen County Sheriff's Department and by the, and by the uh, Michigan State Police. It seems that Carolyn was driving along somewhere up in Michigan around Grand Rapids or Battle Creek. I think it was up by Grand Rapids. She had gone off the road. She went down through a ravine and her tree, and her car hit a tree and instantly burst into flame. the oncoming vehicle driven by a volunteer fire department. 
fire uh, firefighter. The car that was coming up behind Carol and our end. Between the two of them, they got Carol and out of the car. She was taken to the hospital. The only thing the Michigan State Police would tell me was, she's alive, but we need to get a hold of the family. Ends up that Carolyn had a broken neck, along with multiple other injuries, and here they were getting her out of the car with a broken neck. But because they knew what they were doing, they got her out and got her transported to the hospital. She stayed there for a matter of, I think it was three months at that hospital, and then she came back to Fort Wayne, and she spent the next three or four months in rehab at Lutheran Hospital. I could not get to her because I had no driving orders, because I had had recent surgery. I managed to get a hold of the district superintendent in, in uh, Battle Creek in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he took over from there. And he had pastors with that family around the clock for the first 48 to 72 hours. Volunteer firefighter, an RM, a miracle. I don't know. You tell me. There have been some others along the way. The addicted. The spiritually lost who turn to Jesus, surrender their lives, and come away from their habit. When Kay and I were on vacation, we had the privilege of meeting and spending some time with another couple. He was a retired police officer from um, North Carolina. <coughs> I asked him that day, one of those days, I said, what is the most what, what situation did you deal with that brought you the most joy? Now, I don't think he was expecting that question. But what brought you the most joy? And he, without a moment of hesitation, said, it was a few years ago. I encountered a woman who was living on the streets. She was a prostitute. She was into drugs. She was big into alcohol. He said, I talked with her that night. I spent a little time with her. Talked to her about her faith. The fact that her life could be turned around. He said, I never saw her again. Until the last year that I was with the department. She came up to me and she said, do you remember me? And he said, yes, I do. She said, I just want you to know, I turned my life around and no longer on drugs. I'm off the alcohol. I have a job. I'm living on my own in my own apartment. And she said, I am feeling so blessed. Miracle. We hear those stories. The tough addictions to get out of be able to overcome. <laughs> so let me ask you, do you believe in miracles? Is anybody here, anybody here that may care to share your own personal miracle with us this morning? Yes. When I first started to drive, <coughs>
Gary was the only one um, in Huntington County that year that was treated by the first responders that they saved with the cardiac arrest. And he was on Lutheran for several days and we didn't know that he would make it, but he's as strong as a horse now and works like a dog. So yeah, I believe in miracles. You know, there's lots of stories going on. And if you think about the way that God has been at work in your life, you may even determine that something in your past has been a miracle. Or the stories that we heard this morning. Miracles involving someone that you know and love. This morning, we talk about Jesus turning the water into wine. The first miracle. But before we go there, I don't know how you envision Cana. This is Cana as of 2007, when my wife and I had the privilege of being there. That was the tour bus that we, we rode to get in. Streets are lined with businesses, with apartments. You can see in the corner up there the first miracle. Right, whoops. I did it again. I don't know why, but that's supposed to be just a pointer. John, can you give me back to the thank you? Uh, the sign says the first miracle. Um, here we are. It's a rainy day that day. We were there in March. And uh, I'm sorry, the pictures seem to be a little further away than what I thought they, they would be. But we're making our way to the church that is now built on the site where it is believed this miracle took place. It's a big church, as you can see from the inside. When you walk all the way up to the altar area and look up, this is what you're looking at. That's uh, Brian um, Byron Kaiser. He's one of the pastors who was with us on our journey. And a lot of us um, went to the altar that day and uh, with his group, and we renewed our marriage vows, which was a wonderful experience. Um, that's a young guy with my wife. I <laughs> didn't have any hair then either. <laughs> and there we are from the outside of the church. But the streets, like I say, are lined with shops. Probably not exactly what you're thinking of when you think about Cana. It's changed a lot since Jesus was there. But to be able to walk on those streets and to be able to know that we're walking where Jesus at one time walked, whether it was here in Cana or wherever we were, knowing that Jesus had been there. It's quite a quite a quite an experience. This was on our way back out of here. So today we talk about the first miracle. In this text from John, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now, Cana is a short distance from Capernaum. It's located in the southeast of Capernaum. It's four miles north of Nazareth. It's believed to be uh, Nathaniel's home, Nathaniel, one of the disciples. But there's several things, and by the way, you've got an outline in your bulletin. Um, I'm going to try to provide these once in a while if you want to fill them in for yourselves, you're, you're invited to. I would also like to know what your opinions are when I give you those things, if you appreciate them or if you'd rather just not have them. Know that there's an outline there. We don't know several things. Well, number one, we don't know who's running the world. We don't know um, any details about the couple. We don't know if they were perhaps related in some way to Mary and Joseph. But we just don't know. It would appear that maybe Mary was uh, connected in some some way uh, because she seemed to have or seemed to be in a, in a position of uh, somewhat of a, an authoritarian position. Uh, maybe they're helping to serve as a, a hostess or something, but we don't we don't really know. 
We do know that a problem arose. We know that the wine ran out. But there's a danger when we look at our scripts, at our scriptures, sometimes because we become so familiar with the story that we perhaps won't think about the significance of the events in the story. Some people may look at that and say, so what's the big deal? They ran out of wine. That happens in a lot of weddings. No, no big deal there. But I think there's several things we need to realize. One is that a Jewish wedding was and is a very large and extravagant affair. Um, I never knew just how large and how extravagant until my niece married a Jewish man last summer. And the wedding took place in Chicago. She's Christian and he's Jewish. And at the beginning of the service, it was it was a, a very it was a combined Jewish and Christian service. Um, and then we got into the reception, and there was music that was playing kind of behind the scenes, and uh, and uh, we had a meal. Once the meal was over, oh my goodness, we got into a true Jewish celebration. Um, there was all kinds of dancing. The bride was lifted in the air. I don't know how many times by a group. Um, that place just went wild. You know, it's the duty of the Jew at that time, and still is, to entertain their guests and provide for their every need. It was the law. To run out of something, to be unable to provide it, was not only humiliating, but it was also punishable by the courts. Maybe you didn't know that. To run out was a big deal. Mary was apparently in some sort of an important position. She brought the problem to the attention of Jesus. In verses 3 through 5. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Jesus said, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now the King James translation says, Jesus' response, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has become that RSV is pretty much worded the same way. The New English says, Your concern, mother, is not mine. My hour has not yet come. J.B. Phillips' translation says, Is that your concern or mine? My time has not yet come. Now, Roger Fredrickson, in his commentary on John, says one of the most almost uh, one can almost sense a subtle parental pressure in Mary's announcement that the wine was running out. Jesus no longer lived under her roof. The time of her authority had passed. So her claim had no claim on him. Her concern had no claim on him. Jesus had moved out in obedience to his father, and now all his times are set by a higher authority. And he must await the hour fixed by his father. When Jesus addresses his mother, he's not being he's not being aloof or distant. He's speaking with tenderness and respect. It's the same way in which he commits her to John's care from the cross. Woman, behold your son. William Barclay says what Jesus is saying is don't worry. You don't quite understand what's going on. Leave things to me and I will settle them in my own way. Mary's response in telling the servants to do whatever Jesus told them to do reflects Mary's understanding that Jesus would handle it. His response wasn't cutting it wasn't sarcastic. <clears throat> Verses 6 and 7. Nearby stood 
with six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Think about that for a minute. But Jesus said, the servants filled the, filled the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. These were the same jars that were used for the for the rites of purification, for the ceremonial washing, the washing of the hands, the washing of the feet. By Jewish law, the servants were required to wash the feet of all guests before entering the house. Guests had to wash their hands before the meal and between every course of the meal. These jars held 20 to 30 gallons and there were six of them. So you might ask, why did Jesus have them filled to the brim? Because in so doing, Jesus removed all doubt that anything else had been added to what was in those containers. Verses 8 and 9. Then he told them, Now draw some out. Take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet had tasted the water that had been <laughs> turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Do you realize those six jars divided 120 to 180 gallons of wine? make any big deal out of it. He didn't draw any attention to himself. Only his servants knew where that had come from. And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine. And the guests have had, when the guests have had too much to drink, that's when you bring out the best wine, not now. You've already run out. But you have saved the best until now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first signs through which he revealed his glory. His disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And there they stayed for a few days. So let me ask you this morning. What difference could or should this scripture verse, this text, this story, what difference could it or should it make in your life and in mine? I think one point when we're faced with a problem and we don't know how to solve it, turn to Jesus. So often we try to deal with the problem ourselves instead of, instead of turning it over to start with. How much time do we waste in worry and frustration and anxiety and frustration when we just turn it over to Jesus? Good and would make all the difference in the world. Follow Mary's example. Take it to Jesus. Knowing that Jesus is going to deal with it in his time and in his own way. But so often we pray, you know, Lord, I need patience to give it to me now. It's going to be in his time, not ours. It's going to be in his way. Though we must not, we, we may not understand that we, we must go forward in the confidence that Jesus knows what's best for us and he's going to provide for us. He knows what you need. He knows what you need even before you ask. Second point, there's no limit to God's grace. What 
Jesus solved the problem, there was an abundance of wine, 120 to 180 gallons. I think it says that God's grace is not limited. There will be more than enough to spend. Given the a position I have, we have asked you I can't believe you're still forgiving me. Even after this, you're still forgiving me. Your grace is still there. It's still there for you. Regardless of where you've been, regardless of what you've said, regardless of anything you've ever done, God's grace is there. God can take any life. He can take any sin. He can take any guilt that you may have. He can take any pain. And he and he alone can turn it into something sweet and beautiful and new. I don't know how you picture Jesus. Everything I've ever read about a Jewish wedding talks about the joy, the laughter, the singing, the music, the dancing. Is your Jesus a laughing Jesus? Or does he sit around a stone face? I can't picture Jesus stone face. I don't know about you. Someone who never laughed, never smiled, <clears throat> who never went out for fun or to have a good time. I picture Jesus as having a, a sense of humor. I think he has to sometimes. I mean, come on. Take the, uh, take the stick out of your own eye. The log out of your own eye. What about when they hate you? The giraffe. <laughs> I don't know. I think there has to be some humor in there. I can't imagine Jesus turning water into wine without a smile on his face or a twinkle in his eye for you. Another lesson. Jesus needs to be part of every wedding celebration and of every marriage. I was doing a wedding some years ago, preparing to do a wedding some years ago. He was a member of the church. She was not. I talked to him from the very beginning about the fact that God is going to be a part of this ceremony that God referred to many, many times in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, format of the, of the wedding, she expressed some dismay with that. But I said, "It's the way it is, and God is going to be part of this wedding. If I'm going to do it, God is going to be part of the wedding." And she was okay with that. Then we got into the rehearsal that night. Now we had everybody gathered. Family was there. Her future mother-in-law was there. Her future father-in-law had passed. We had a whole wedding party. Everybody was there. And I started going through the wedding vows again. We talked about them several times. I started going through the, the, uh, the uh, service. And I got to one part of it and made reference to God, and she absolutely exploded. We are not going to have God in this ceremony. And she just rolled me up, chewed me up one side and down the other. The wedding party were just standing there with their mouths hanging open. I thought they probably hanging open as far as they could be until I said what I said. <laughs> when she got all done, I said, God, are you done? You got it all off your mind now? You said I wouldn't want to say? Yes. I don't know where you're going to have your wedding, but it isn't going to be here. We've talked about that before. And if you wish to stand on what you just said, then the wedding 
was canceled and now I have to find somebody else in some other location to do it. This was less than 24 hours before the wedding. The wedding party was stunned. The wedding took place the next day and we did it just as it was planned. It's been quite a few years. I understand from the mother in law, they're still together, they're connected with the church. So they're not a state. God needs to be a part of the wedding. Thank you. 